is Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world, in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a Wednesday evening, Wacky Wednesday here on ZFM Sport. Thanks for being here on your station, my station, everybody's station, ZFM Stereo. The team is here, Mike, Chris, Alois, Sean, our producer. My name is Barry. Front and center, the impasse between the Sports and Recreation Commission and, of course, the football mother body here in Zimbabwe, Zifa. Now, the SRC has said they will not be bullied by threats of FIFA sanctions to force them to compromise their mission. And that mission is to deal with issues they believe are holding back the development of domestic football. It'll be interesting to hear the thoughts of the studio team on that one. You can also let us know online at ZFM Sport. That's a hot one. We've also got international sports news where South Africa coach Mark Boucher says the Proteas have a considerable amount of catching up to do to reach the same white ball standards as a team like England. We'll then take you around the world in 60, lifting off in England, where Eddie Jones is confident rugby will emerge from a dull period dominated by defence as his side prepare to dominate a weekend Le Bleu in the Nations Cup final at Twickenham, pitting England versus France on a Sunday. In Bahrain, Lewis Hamilton will miss this weekend's Sakia Grand Prix after testing positive for the coronavirus. And the news out of Japan, Thomas Bach will stand unopposed to be re-elected as president of the International Olympic Committee next year. It's Wacky Wednesday, so halfway through the show, you can look forward to a wacky track courtesy of DJ Baz. Then we'll dive into the beautiful game today. We're camping out in the UEFA Champions League where Real Madrid coach Zinedine Zidane says his side need to remain calm despite their 2-0 defeat to Shakhtar Donetsk. Diego Simeone acknowledged a failure to take their chances cost Atletico Madrid as his side were punished late on in a one-all draw with Bayern Munich. And in tonight's action, Manchester United are just one point from sealing their place in the last 16 with a game to spare ahead of their meeting with last year's runners-up Paris Saint-Germain at Old Trafford. All of that, so much more to look forward to here on ZFM Sport. But first, our power play. Here's Ariana Grande. It's called Positions. Everybody, take your positions. It's going to be a good one. The Warriors, the Chevrons, the Cheetahs, the Mighty Warriors, and the Sables. From the pool to the track to the field, we are Team Zimbabwe. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. You can catch us online at ZFM Sport and our individual capacities at Chris Midzi, at Mike Madoda, at Gazaman14, at Sean Tafirenika, and at Barry Manandi. Let's get after it. On the home front today, we're talking administration of sport and in particular the Sports and Recreation Commission. Now, they've said that they will not be bullied by threats of FIFA sanctions to force them to compromise their mission. And that mission is to deal with issues they believe are holding back the development of domestic football. In a statement last night, the SRC board said they believe they will get the backing of FIFA in their mission to try and reposition Zimbabwean football whose progress, they claim, is being held back by a cocktail of challenges, including questionable leadership. Michael, is the leadership questionable? Can we get the support of FIFA? After all, Sports and Recreation Commission is government. Is this not the dreaded government interference? Barry, uh, let me just uh, answer your two questions. Uh, the, the first one, obviously, uh, the crew out at 53 Livingston Avenue, are they the best 
uh, to be running and governing football in the country? I don't think so. They've hardly covered themselves in glory. Football has gone backwards. There hasn't been any tangible strategy on the ground to develop the game, whether it's at grassroots uh, level or at the pro or elite level. We're seeing the same problems that were bedeviling Zimbabwe in football three, four, 10, 15 years ago, still in place as far as Zimbabwean football is concerned. So uh, the Felton Kamambo executive is not uh, my ideal team to try and get Zimbabwe out of the hole uh, that they find themselves in as far as football is concerned. Then your second question, Barry, about the dreaded government intervention. Unfortunately, FIFA does not, does not, Barry, smile or take kindly to any form of government intervention, no matter what the circumstances. What am I talking about, Barry? You take a look at the situation uh, in uh, 2018, where Ghana and Nigeria were threatened with expulsion from FIFA uh, because of government interference, the Ghanaian uh, government actually came up with a dossier that proved beyond doubt that there was corruption, that there was pilfering, there were all sorts of things that were happening at the Ghanaian Football Association, but still FIFA say, hell no, put them back in place and let football deal with football issues. So the world over, whether it's in Ghana, in Nigeria again, in the same year, 2018, or currently right now, it is Namibia that is actually at the center of African football troubles because they're also uh, facing exactly the same, same situation we are, where their Sports and Recreation Commission, backed by government, has also come out and try to play hardball with the Namibian Football Association. But again, FIFA has written to Namibia and the government warning them that, you know what, football has got to be allowed to deal with football issues. So whilst there may be justification, Barry, the SRC has to tread very lightly. They have to be tactical yeah. about the way they go about in their attempt to try and bring sanity to Zimbabwean football. So FIFA, just like our good Lord, have said, touch not my anointed, Chris. And uh, in truth, is the anointed worthy of touching, in your view? Is there a case for intervention? Um, I think there's definitely a case for intervention. Um, like Mike said, um, they haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. We can't see advancement. Um, there's no clear paper trail. There's no clear audit of what happens to finances, whether they come from FIFA, whether they come from government. We're not seeing a great deal of accountability. Besides when they decide to throw up a media statement in defense of themselves, we're not seeing this organization being proactive in terms of developing anything um, right across the sport. So for me, there is reason for intervention. How you go about the intervention is, I think, what Mike was saying, that you need to be very tactful about how you go about it. Because we could be facing a situation where if there is, uh, if FIFA does deem that this is government interference and we get um, suspended, then that has major, major implications for Zimbabwean football for several years. So it's a, it's a very tricky situation. And as much as the SRC would want to come in and rectify the situation in football, it's, they could be doing more harm than good. Uh, Alois, we are uh, have impending doom because you look at it, the SRCs wanted uh, the ZIFA board replaced by a normalization uh, committee and in FIFA's response, uh, which came through the office of the Deputy Secretary General uh, in charge of administration, Alistair Bell, they advised the SRC that conditions prevailing at ZIFA then did not warrant an intervention that would see the board being disbanded and replaced by a normalization committee. So if FIFA says that the situation may be bad, but isn't as bad as to uh, involve or encourage us to set up a normalization committee, are we facing that impending doom that Chris is pointing out that we're going to be marked as government interference has gotten involved in ZIFA, therefore you're suspended? Of course, they, uh, it's, it's going to come to that, uh, obviously, but uh, like uh, the SRC said, they said they're not intimidated by it. I know, I'm not sure what that means, that they're not intimidated, because even if we are not intimidated, we can still get banned. You know, and uh, it it it's, it will still affect it will still affect us. Like Mike said, we need we need to be tactical about it. And uh, FIFA has never in the history of FIFA. You look at the history of FIFA; they have never been uh, 
an organization to actually come down heavily on football associations around the world. They are very, they are very soft. Only it. it's not like it's a gang men squad. It's like their squad. It's a squad together. They are like they 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 are head of a cartel that is <laughs> operating in that kind of like system. So it's one of theirs. They they look like they are actually protecting them. I don't know why they do it, but they always do it. So to be tactical is actually to play the game here at home. If we see that these guys are not doing well, find ways to put them out, not to uh, to go about harshly and and inviting bans for us. We need to find ways to actually make sure how do we put these guys out so that we can actually have better people in office. And, and I think uh, Alois is very kind uh, in his uh, description of FIFA. Uh, the cynics out there would probably describe FIFA as one of the most corrupt organizations uh, in the world. Uh, and that's uh, because of the way they go about things, Barry. And uh, you and I had a bit of a chinwag, I think a bit of a natter last night, and we were talking about sort of like the amounts that we are talking about. Uh, when we talk about the COVID relief, okay, we're talking about uh, uh, plus minus 2 million US dollars. When we're talking about the money that's coming to Zimbabwe in terms uh, of funding annually, we're again talking about a plus minus um, uh, 2 million dollars. That's US. What is that amount in the grand scheme of things at, at Zurich? That's probably the fuel bill uh, for uh, Infantino's uh, private jet whenever he's moving from continent to continent. So it's not a big amount of money. It's big in terms of the African context, the Zimbabwean context, because we have a football structure that is not used to money or that does not have money, uh, especially if you're outside of South Africa and Egypt and the North African Country. So when you $2 million, it's a whack load of money. But for them, it's nothing. This is an organization that generates $5 billion at a World Cup tournament and uh, even more billions in intervening years. So it's really a drop in the bucket. That's why FIFA does not hold a footballer association's feet to the fire, as it were, because what they want from Africa is not good governance. It's not the development of football, but what they want from Africa are the votes that keep them at the helm of football in there. Zurich and them making the multi-billion dollar decisions. And so the votes are what are key. The issue here, guys, is that we're dealing with a ZIFA board, Chris, that was elected. These are elected officials, elected under a ZIFA constitution. Perhaps the answer might be for the SRC to delve and dig into either the ZIFA constitution or its own SRC act and find the loopholes that might get these guys out. And that's exactly it. Um, I think when it comes to to sport and to football, we generally like to think of it. And yes, in as much as it, everything should be run in a very business like setup, it's a lot of politics. Um, it's a lot of politics, a lot of politicking. And if you are able to use loopholes and able to influence the right people, you are able to get things done. I think the SRC approach at the moment is um, very big brotherly to come down on the organization. Instead of trying to see, okay, what sort of strings can we pull, what loopholes like you talked about in those acts can actually be used in order to get to a situation where we have the right people running the organization. This is politics. Uh, and the, the mistake that the SRC is making varies to assume that uh, FIFA is, is a professional organization uh they make the mistake yes. of assuming that fifa uh is <laughs> you know it's it's run like ernst and young uh or deloitte it's not run like that uh, chris <laughs> makes a very fine point fifa is a political organization so they need to think politics rather than good corporate governance and professionalism they've got to win the political battle the political intrigue has got to go their way Alois, quickly, when you read the SRC statement last night, did it send chills down your spine? Yeah, it did. You know, it, it did, Barry, because at the end of the day, we know where we are headed, you know, so it, 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 it does. But like, like, like Mike and, and Chris are saying, it has to be tactical. We have to deal with it here internally. We have to find ways, like you said, the loopholes to get these guys out. We need to find ways, use the constitution, use the SRC Act, use something, the government, to, to find ways or to just look for ways, legal ways, to get these guys out. They can they can get out. But if we just go about suspending people, it's not going to happen because we are going to get suspended. Yeah, it did really uh, send chills down my spine. It, 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 it won't work. We need to find better ways of putting these guys out. Yeah. They need to get out because we all agree that the football has gone down and they need to get and out. But how to get them out? 
And uh, that statement by the SRC being very strongly worded and uh, loaded uh, with uh, certain statements that made one think that uh, SRC might be thinking of the nuclear option, the nuclear head with our plan and uh, a ban might just see football being the ultimate loser. And what we want to see is football winning. A quick update out of the Warriors camp, the coach. Warriors coach, it is Dravko Logarisic. Loga, he's disappointed the proposed mini league tournament is unlikely to take place this month. Now, this will force him to pick players without any competitive action for the Chan preparations, which get underway on Monday. So, he'll be taking on board a squad that hasn't had a kick of football since possibly December 2019. Hi, my name's Ryan Kenz, Sunshine Tour professional golfer, and you're listening to ZFM Sport. Right, let's give you a local sports news a roundup starting with golf where Zimbabwe's professional golfers Tudor Bismarck Jr. and rising amateur Terence Keith failed to make it through the South African Open Championship qualifiers yesterday. Bismarck, who is the son of Bishop Tudor Bismarck, was giving it a try in a European Tour tournament, having travelled from his base in the United States of America yesterday. Single round qualification was a tough one as only eight slots were up for grabs out of 53 entries that took to the field. In Netball News, with the Rainbow Amateur Netball League season a write-off this year, players and coaches say that they'll have to go an extra mile to get back into shape to compete next year. There are hopes a tournament could be staged before the end of the year, but the league secretary general Moses Gukurume uh, said it will not be possible to have games this year. Attention is now shifting to next year with hope there will be a conducive environment to have a normal season. Let's wrap it up with Motorsport News where after spending two months training under former three-time world motocross champion Yves de Maria in France, Emile Croiset uh, can't wait for the Zimbabwe Summer Series. The showcase is expected to rev off at Donnybrook Raceway in Harare next weekend. This year's Summer Series, which is the country's premier competition in the motorcycling sport of motocross, will be held over three days. Hi, this is Mike Madod, and you can catch me and the team for all the latest breaking news out of the world of sport, local as well as international, on your favorite station, my station, your station, ZFM. We are Z Team on ZFM Sport. Z. From the front of the grid to the back of the net, it's ZFM Sport. International Sports News Roundup, where the world comes out to play. There's been plenty of international cricket of late and today we are zoning in on that T20 series that's just been completed in South Africa between the Proteas and England. Before we get into it, just a reminder that we got a Champions League report in the beautiful game that's in the second half of the show. You don't want to miss it. Now, South Africa coach Mark Boucher says that the Proteas have a considerable amount of catching up to do to reach the same white ball standards as a team like England. Speaking after South Africa, failed to win a match in a home T20 series for the first time in the format's history, Boucher acknowledged that England are in a different class when compared with other teams. The third T20 international was played last night and here is the tale of the tape. Uh, South Africa making a commendable 191 for three. Rassi van der Dusen, 74 not out. Former skipper Faf Duplessis, 52 not out. The pick of the English bowlers was Ben Stokes, 2 for 26. England then making light work surprisingly. A lot of people thought it was a competitive total but England blitzed at 192 for the loss of of just one wicket and all that done in just 17.4 overs meaning that they did it with a full three overs to spare david milan 99 not out unlucky not to get to a century and then joss butler his accomplice 67 not out england winning by nine wickets and they of course sweep the series three nil now protest captain Quinton de Kock says England have been better than the Proteas. I just thought they played really well. Um, you know, I think they put our, our, our bowlers under a lot of pressure, um, you know, and they played the game really cleverly and, you know, we couldn't really find a way to stop them. So um, I don't think it was a skill thing assisting there, but just played really, really well. Z. 
He's absolutely right, isn't he, Barry? England won the first T20 international by five wickets, then won the second one by four, four wickets. So, uh, to be honest, uh, the pro tiers have been schooled. Yeah, they have been schooled. And in truth, uh, there is uh, almost a gulf in class. Um, not surprising that, of course, this uh, win in the, uh, the series win uh, puts England as the top uh, T20 team. Obviously, Australia can reclaim that uh, once they conclude their series with, uh, with India. Uh, but you can see that there is a gulf in class. The only challenge is that uh, South Africa ordinarily should be a lot more competitive, especially at home should be a lot more competitive against a team like England. So there is something horribly wrong with the Proteas uh, a lineup at the moment uh, that's making them uh, that much, that difference between them and England. One of the big debates, Chris, uh, around South African uh, cricket will always be the quota system, uh, the black quota system where players of colour uh, have got to be uh, in the starting 11 uh, for South Africa. And therefore, consequently, you have uh, players like uh, Temba Bavuma, uh, Kahiso Rabada, uh, the likes of Ngidi. But when you take a look at the bowling, I think the bowlers are there on merit. Kahiso Rabada is one of the best bowlers in the world. Uh, Ngidi is coming along uh, nicely. Uh, but when you take a look at the bat, the the quota system hasn't really done the proteas uh, a, a lot of favors because the black batsmen that are being produced in south african cricket are just not up to standard if you want to call a spade a spade they're just not up to standard um and then that brings about questions around the quota system itself to say do we need the quota system is it effective and once you have that there are questions obviously there are going to be questions around selection and obviously questions around these black batsmen in terms of their capabilities so in an ideal scenario the quota system should be correcting obviously the past wrongs of apartheid and everything but at the moment it's just raising questions around the quality of the black batsmen that are coming to the fore Barry, is it going to take time? Uh, you and I went to school. Now, pardon us, Chris, so we're going to have a conversation. Uh, you, you probably went to school. Uh, both you and, uh, and Sean, actually. <laughs> now, we, we, we went to school, Barry, in an era where, to be honest, there was a lot of racism uh, in sports. Uh, yeah. The primary schools we attended, the high schools we attended. And here's what I'm talking about. There was almost the compartmentalization uh, of of players according to race in sports teams, especially cricket and rugby. Let me start with rugby. We all knew that the specialist positions when we were at school belonged to the white kids, no matter how good the black kids were. So the fly half was always a white kid. Yeah. The scrum half was always a white kid. The hooker was likely to be a white kid. And the fullback was probably a white kid and the eighth man was a white kid. Yeah. The black kids were wanted for their height, either as locks, their weight as props, or their speed as wingers. Okay? Mm. And then you go to cricket now, which is what we are talking about. The wicket keeper was usually a white kid. Sure. The opening batsmen, the, 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 the top order batsmen were usually the white kids. And the black kids usually, they were the bowlers the fast bowlers, the TOA strike bowlers. And that's how it was. And therefore, maybe South Africa is struggling to strip away that sort of system uh, in the South African school system, because that is the foundation of where these cricketers are coming through. Yeah. And so until we see a system where at grassroots level, the black kids are being given equal opportunities with the bats, we are unlikely to see, Barry, a big number of black batsmen in the South African system knocking on the doors of on the door of the Proteus. You you summarized it perfectly, Mike. And uh, in truth, I think that there, there, there should be an understanding that look, diversity works. In, 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 whether it's in a corporate setting, in a sports uh, on a sports field, or whatever the case may be. So it's not a case for uh, the lack of diversity. The challenge with a quota system is that there is a slippery slope between a quota system and tokenism. Uh, whereby you sometimes end up with those that are included being uh, uh, tokens rather than being the best for those particular positions. 100%. The fact that there is that silo system whereby if you're a black kid, chances are they think that you're a bowler. Uh, you're unlikely to be an all-rounder. Uh, you're unlikely to be a specialist batsman. 
So consequently, you're placed in that silo and you can only be in that silo. In some cases and examples that we can discuss here, there have been good batsmen at school that have been converted to bowling simply because they believe that, you know, that's where you should be. I think Mululu King Kala, if you remember Mululu King Kala, uh, I think uh, we were sort of like the same generation. Uh, he was out at yeah. Falcon College. One of the best batsmen, stand-up batsmen uh, at school level. And then when he went into the Chevron system, uh, he was a bowler. Yeah. A bowling all-rounder, and we were all surprised that uh, we all thought that Mululigin Kala would be staking a claim uh, as a batsman with the Shepherds. So, so I've always been an a, a, an advocate, like the case of Mululigin Kala, that let the best person for the role take it up and let's get let's make it a holistic change whereby our training institutions that's our academies cricket academies are producing and have a system whereby you're producing a cricketer and not necessarily a white cricketer a black cricketer whatever the case may be you're producing a good cricketer that's the only way that this transformation then becomes uh uh, uh it more it, it yields more results more so than being an act in to tokenism Okay, just some of the problems that are facing South African cricket at the moment. And Barry sums that up very well that uh, the system has got to produce good enough batsmen despite the quota system. It mustn't be tokenism where black cricketers are just filling up slots just because the proteas have to put someone there. But they actually come in on merits like the likes of Kahiso Rabada. That victory in the third T20 international uh, taking England above Australia at the top of the ICC rankings. And of course, uh, England playing some really good white ball cricket at the moment. And they now shift focus to the one day international series. The first one day international is on Friday in Cape Town. They move to PAL uh, for the second one day international on Sunday. And then next Wednesday, they are back in Cape Town for the third one day international. And the Proteas have suffered a major blow on the eve of that series with the news that Hakiso Rabada has been ruled out through injury. Rabada, who wasn't named in the Proteas team for the third and final T20 international at Newlands last night, suffered a right adductor strain. Hi, my name is Sean Williams, Zimbabwe cricket captain. You're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. Around the world in 60 seconds. International sports news. We take off in England where Eddie Jones's confident rugby will emerge from a dull period dominated by defence as the side prepare to dominate a week in France in the Nations Cup final at Twickenham on Sunday. Former England captain Dylan Hartley admitted the emphasis on shutting down opponents had been boring and there is a perceptible frustration among players of all nations that it has become more profitable to play without the ball. We head over to Bahrain where Lewis Hamilton will miss this weekend's Sakir Grand Prix after testing positive for coronavirus. The Mercedes driver returned three negative tests last week but began displaying mild symptoms on Monday and was informed at the same time that a contact prior to his arrival last week in Bahrain had subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. He'll be replaced this weekend by George Russell. In news from Japan, Thomas Bach will stand unimposed to be re-elected as president of the International Olympic Committee next year. The 66-year-old will be the only candidate for the election, which will be held during the 137th IOC session in Athens next March. Who hasn't covered themselves in glory? What hasn't gone according to plan? Who should hang their head in shame? Our Plonker of the Week on CFM Sport. <laughs> this is a feature I like every single week. Taking a look at who hasn't covered themselves in glory. Chris, who do you reckon? Um, This guy has Twitter fingers. We know he's a loud mouth, but he's really been going off on social media um, since he left FC Platinum. And that is Peter Dion, Coach Peter Dion. <laughs> he's been going off on social media and this is a journalist um, tweeting the FC Platinum account itself, the supporters account, and to the extent of using expletives in his tweets. Let me read you one. You are sick in your head. What was yourself playing on the camp? Because the only people who did play on camping 
at that level didn't say this nonsense. Obviously, there's a lot of grammatical errors. Who, who, who is he? Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the FC Platinum supporters account. This wow. is the account that for a very long time was showing him a lot of wow. support when he joined wow. FC Platinum. So it's it's a little bit wild. Um, some journalists as well. Um, there's a gentleman Isn't this just a cry for attention? I mean, uh, this is a guy who's just been uh, kicked uh, out of the he's office at a job that uh, he was looking forward to doing uh, in the CAF Champions League. Isn't this just a yeah. cry for it's it's a cry Loveless. for attention Loveless. and almost wanting to stay relevant in the Zimbabwean context. I think he loves it here <laughs> because he went ahead and had a press conference as well. Um, when he left Zishaman, he had a press conference in Bulawayo for who knows what reason. Um, but it's a constant um, seeking of relevance that we're seeing from Peter Dion. So ZFM Sport expect an expletive laden tweet about ZFM Sport from Peter De Jong, our plonker of the week. <laughs> Who hasn't covered themselves in glory? What hasn't gone according to plan? Who should hang their head in shame? Our plonker of the week on ZFM Sport. The big leagues. The big teams, the big players, the beautiful game on ZFM Sport. Match day five of the UEFA Champions League began last night with action from Group A through to D. And the results out of Group A, Lokomotiv Moscow suffering a very disappointing 3-1 reverse at home to RB Salzburg. And then Atletico Madrid in the big game versus Bayern Munich at the Wanda Metropolitano. That one ended in a one all draw. Bayern Munich, of course, have already qualified for the knockout stages. Atletico Madrid, they are clinging on to second place, knowing that, of course, their fate is in their own hands, heading into the final match day, which is match day six. Now, Chris, you had uh, predicted a thumping win for <laughs> Bayern Munich, but uh, on the night, uh, it was hardly that. Uh, they, they were lucky to dodge a bullet uh, because was- Atletico Madrid uh, the better side. Atletico Madrid with the better side, it's just unfortunate that Bayern did manage um, to get that goal in just before time. So it's, yeah, just, I hope no one went to the betting house on my prediction. Yeah, certainly not. But uh, uh, to be fair, Barry, they did rest a number of their key players. Uh, Robert Lewandowski was rested. Uh, the likes of uh, Manuel Neuer, uh, he was rested as well. So uh, it was sort of like half and half. Uh, you could even say it was a, a second string uh, by Munich side. And still, they were very competitive. Very competitive. Uh, I took a penalty, late penalty for them to to uh, salvage a draw out of this game. But uh, look, I think uh, uh, Atletico themselves were a bit profligate in front of goal. And uh, I think that that was what uh, assisted Bayern Munich more so than Bayern Munich uh, being at the races. I think, uh, look, this was a game that was tilted in one direction. And if you don't take your chances, chances are it'll punish you. And of course, uh, Atletico Madrid's uh, problems in front of goal are the reason why their last three matches have all ended in draws. Uh, let's move on to Group B. Shakhtar Donetsk 2-0 victors over Real Madrid. We'll be getting the thoughts of Alois Mungira in a minute. And Borussia Mönchengladbach beaten by Internationale 3-2 in Germany. But uh, something of a surprise result. Alois, uh, Real Madrid losing uh, at Shakhtar, uh, this is a game that even though they are away from home, uh, a lot of people expected Real Madrid to kick on and win it. But in the end, they were outclassed. Yeah, Mike, it was surprising. You know, at first when they lost the uh, the reverse fixture, you know, we thought it was a fluke. And the way they came back and uh, tried to salvage the game, we thought it was great. But now look at the look at look at the situation. I I, I couldn't believe it. When I'm looking at Real Madrid, I'm looking at the way they are playing, they are just flat. In the first half, you could actually tell that, you know what, it's not the Real Madrid that we know. Second half, they were completely outclassed. Let's be honest, they were outclassed, they were nowhere to be found. And at the end of the day, it was not a surprise that they lost. They are just a flat Real Madrid. They just, um, you know, when you look at Real Madrid as the Galacticos and look at the Real Madrid this time around, they're too 
different worlds apart and it's actually very sad for a big team like Real Madrid to actually be losing to teams like Shakhtar Donetsk. It's like FC Platinum losing to Mshawane back to back. And now their coach Zinedine Zidane says his side needs to remain calm despite that defeat and he has vowed to keep fighting on after his side were left in danger of a shock early Champions League exit. No, no, para nada, no. Not at all. I will not resign. We will, however, keep going. Today we did very well in the first half and deserved to come away with at least a goal. The game would have changed if we had scored first. But the truth is that their goal hurt us a lot because we were playing well in the attacking half and pressing high up the pitch. We also had two or three chances hitting the post too, but the ball did not want to go in. And then it became complicated. Z. Zidane is uh, calling for calm heads, Barry. And uh, to be honest, in terms of experience, he's got plenty in that squad. If you take a look at uh, the players at his disposal, Casemiro, Luka Modric, Tony Kroos, the likes of Rafael Varane, Karim Benzema, Marcelo. Those are experienced campaigners, but could also that be the genesis or the root yeah. of his problems? Absolutely. That those players are now past their sell-by date in terms of being the best in Europe. Yeah, he doesn't have enough freshness in the squad, and I think that it's beginning to show. Uh, it's all a bit stale now at uh, Real Madrid, um, and the, the 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 talent that's come through the academy, the the young talent that they've brought in, hasn't fired as quickly as they ho had hoped. Uh, so consequently, you can't you can't sort of change a model. Your 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 model is of Galacticos. Stick to it. Don't try and change and say now we're going to develop and then not change the whole system. That's a problem at Real Madrid, and Zinedine Zidane is going to be a a victim of it if he fails to go into the next round because I don't know. Now Madrid host uh, group leaders uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach next Wednesday, while Shakhtar, who are second due to a superior head-to-head -head record over Real, visit bottom side Inter Milan. It's a shootout in that group. The teams that win on the night progress to the knockout stages of uh, the Champions League. In Group C, Porto and Manchester City played out a goalless draw and Marseille recorded their first win after four straight losses in Group C. They beat Olympiacos 2-1. In Group D, Atalanta and Midtjylland played out a one all draw and Liverpool secured top spot in Group D as well as victory over Ajax with a 1-0 victory. And you've got to say for Jurgen Klopp, uh, Chris, who's limping at the moment because of the amount of injuries that um, he's got. Uh, this would have been a very satisfactory evening for the Reds. It's definitely going to be a satisfying outcome for uh, Jurgen Klopp because of the fact that the goal here was to win and to ensure qualification, whether that's by one goal, which is what they managed to get past Ajax, then that's what he has to work with at the moment because of the numbers of players, uh, the number of players that are missing from his squad. Um, but he's still able to do the business, whether it's in the Champions League or in the English Premier League. And of course, he'll also be happy about uh, young goalkeeper Kevin Kalaha, who came in the place of Allison, and he was able to put in a match, a man of the match, a performance up for Liverpool. That was your Champions League action last night. And of course, coming up, we preview tonight's matches, Group E through to H. Yes, indeed. Let's look at tonight's action. Group E through to H, as Mike pointed out. Your fixtures, Krasnodar entertain Ren, while Sevilla takes on Chelsea. In Group F, Borussia Dortmund versus Lazio. Club Bruges versus Zenit St. Petersburg. In Group G, it's Ferenc Varos taking on Barcelona, while Juventus entertain Dinamo Kiev. And in Group H, Istanbul Basak Shahir takes on RB Leipzig. And Manchester United take on PSG, all to play for in Group H. Let's take a look at that fixture. Manchester United taking on PSG. Let's hear from Manchester United midfielder Donny van der Beek, who is hoping to start tonight. I uh, just work hard every day and I know um, that I, I can give the team something extra and I can help the team a lot. So, yeah, I just were patient. I mean, uh, also in Ajax before, I play in a lot of uh, different positions. I play 8, I play 10, even uh, number 6. So um, I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, 
Uh, I play in uh, a lot of different positions. Z. Alois, well, just one point will do it for United, but they are taking on a PSG side that's limping, uh, that's struggling to get a run of consistency. And Thomas Tuchel calling for the team to do exactly that. It's a question of which PSG and which Manchester United shows up tonight. But you got to think that the cards are probably in Manchester United's favour. Yeah, of course, Barry, because when you look at PSG, they are not doing well. They are not playing well, even in the domestic French League as well. They are not producing results. Like we said, that they don't play at the highest intensity and it affects them in the Champions League. So it's good for Manchester United that they need a point. Manchester United, they you know they they, they fought you know, uh, against, uh, against uh, that, uh, that little club from Turkey, you know, I should say. But <laughs> they came back. They came back with guns blazing, which was actually a very good statement. You know, a statement of intent that in the Champions League they're actually trying to 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 sound like they mean they mean business, which is good for the for the fans. And uh, playing against a, P a PSG that is not firing is actually quite good. I'm sure that the one point is going to be uh, obtained. That they're going to get to get the the one point that they need. Probably a win. You know, if they play according to the way they have been playing right now, the, Manchester United seem to have to be playing with a little bit of energy. A little bit. I'm saying not they're not at the highest level, but a little bit of energy. But with that kind of level of performance, I think they can still uh, snatch a point or even a victory against PSG. Well, that small club from Turkey are Turkish champions, Istanbul Basakşehir, that are being <laughs> referred to by Alois. <laughs> um, Mike, you got to think to yourself that uh, we heard earlier from Donny van der Beek, he's hoping to start. He's a player who we thought was going to be brought in and because of the promise that he showed at Ajax, would be a certain starter after at least a few, maybe six games or so, just bedding in at Manchester United and will be a regular in the team. He hasn't been. Well, he showed more than promise, Barry. Uh, yeah. He absolutely lit it up in the UEFA Champions League. Uh, he was one of the standout players uh, when Ajax stormed through to the uh, semi-finals of the Champions League a couple of seasons ago. And uh, we're very unlucky uh, to miss out to Tottenham Hotspur for the opportunity to play Liverpool uh, in that final that was played in Madrid. So he's been a really good, consistent performer. And once bought, especially for that sort of money, Barry, when you spend £40 million, pounds, uh, you see, they, they, usually people think that you're buying someone who's coming in uh, into the first team. Uh, and I thought that uh, he really needed to be given uh, a run of games, to be given the opportunity to show what he can do, uh, rather than for you to be working him off the bench and uh, you know him looking for opportunities bit part opportunities now and again but i love the fact that over the last two or three games he's begun to get a lot of game time and he's showing what he can do i'd love to see if united deploy him further up the pitch because uh, we have seen him a couple of times play deep in midfield but his actually most effective position is almost in an attacking position. At times, he used to play as a second striker, sometimes actually lead the line uh, for Ajax. So he's a good attacker and he'll give them value if he's operating in and around the box. Uh, the Manchester United's opponents tonight, uh, Chris, look, in truth, we don't know what to expect of 2020, uh, but you've got to think to yourself that PSG are the uh, absolute poster boys for 2020 because you can't go from Jekyll to Hyde that quickly. Uh, PSG finalists in the last edition of the Champions League and now you look at them, they're a diametric opposite of what they were. You, you'll be, they'll be hoping that tonight becomes that turning point where they're able to reclaim their form. And that's definitely going to be problematic for Manchester United because that bounce back from a team um, can be incredibly harsh and I'm not sure if Manchester United, if they come against a full-strength PSG side, will be able to do what they've done before, which is uh, to trump them, essentially. So it's, it's going to be a tricky one. Um, PSG is a little bit too patchy, but from what we've been hearing and seeing and the statements coming out from um, Thomas Tuchel, he's putting a lot more pressure on his side to perform better. So that may do the trick. It may not. It may do the, the complete opposite. But we wait to see what happens. These are two sides who you definitely don't know what's going to happen in every single encounter. Alois, we haven't seen... Uh... Yeah, we haven't seen any any sort of way that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer plays at home. Uh, we've seen him uh, welcome teams to the theater of dreams, sit back, let them have the ball and hit them on the break. And granted, it has worked. What do you anticipate is he's going to approach this? How do you anticipate he's going to approach this game tonight? 
I don't know, baby. You know, I haven't really also uh, understood the way Manchester United is playing. Every game we wait and see for the first 15, 20 minutes to see how exactly the team is playing. Then say, yeah, guys, that's team in the bonus. We don't know. So we have to go in there, watch the first few minutes and see what happens. But if you ask me how I could play, if I was Ole, I would just say let's just go and attack PSG because they are not playing well we can beat them let's just go and play because we need a draw if we score first it's to our advantage because we know that even if we concede a goal we are still in control so I think that's what needs to be done let's go out and play get an early goal so that we cash on ourselves and then we are good to go we play comfortably knowing that we've got we've got it in the back yeah but let's also be be uh, careful guys uh, PSG are quite capable of turning it on uh, yes. they do Quality. They do have yep. the players in their ranks who are able to win this game. So uh, I don't think PSG uh, is daunted at the prospect of playing at Old Trafford. Uh, they will go there believing that they can actually get the win versus Manchester United. And it could put Manchester United in a very precarious position because nothing is won or assured yet in this group. Because if they lose to PSG, then it will be a cup final in Germany versus RB Leipzig. So United want to get that point tonight. And I think that a structured approach versus PSG will be of benefit. The same approach they used in Paris to get that uh, wonderful result. I think they should do the same. You know, make sure that they keep their defensive lines. Make sure that they mark tightly. Don't give Neymar space. Don't give Mbappe space. Keep it nice and tight. Do the job tonight. Don't leave it to chance on the final match day. <laughs> so, what's the result if you look in your crystal ball, Michael? I am seeing PSG winning this one 2-1. Ooh. Chris? I'm with Mike. 2-1. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> what he Hello. said. 1-0, <laughs> uh, Manchester United. Is that heart and head or is that just heart? No, 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 no. no. I think I think Manchester United I I in a good place at the moment. Those are your predictions. Don't hold us to them. Don't yell at us on social media. I'm gonna predict a two-one win for Paris Saint-Germain as well. I think Paris Saint-Germain will go and do the business. This one will go to the final match day, possibly with three teams on nine points apiece. Because if RB Leipzig beats Istanbul tonight, then there are three teams on nine points going into the final match day in Group H. That's the Champions League build-up for tonight. Enjoy it. And we'll catch you tomorrow for our shortened show. May God richly bless you. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Manandi, out. And it's Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, on top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behavior. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport on CFM Stereo. My station, your station.